thing that we do with young people. Has anybody in this room ever been skydiving? Nobody. OK, one. Cool. Uh, anybody want to go skydiving? Uh, a few more. All right. Anybody think I'm a lunatic for even bringing it up? Uh, <laughs> a couple of you. That's OK. That's all right. Uh, so I was kind of one of those people who thought I was a lunatic, too. Uh, and when I went to Stetson University, which when I went to undergrad, and Stetson is in this little town called Deland, which actually isn't known for a whole lot. But one of the things Deland is known for is that it's actually the skydiving capital of the world. You go there, and it's kind of like the United Nations of skydiving. People from all over the place are there. Uh, it's where they've invented the tandem jump. It's got this guy with like a 12-foot beard, and he does all this incredible stuff. And so, I mean, it's just this really uh, amazing hot spot skydiving. I had zero interest, but I had a friend named Tara, a very good friend who's done a lot of this youth work with me. And she kept saying, you can't be here and not go skydiving. So I'm 18. I just come into the school. And she says, you've got you to give it a shot. You've got to try it out. And I think, this is not what I'm interested in. That's not what plans are built for. And I'm not, I'm not going for it. Uh, but uh, she finally pushes me to get out just to this drop zone. And you start seeing people trickling from the sky. Uh, butterflies are going. I'm not feeling real excited. And she, she starts talking to me about, um, about how fun it'll be. She keeps pushing me. She says, don't worry. I'll be with you. And uh, finally, I say, all right, all right, I'll give it a, I'll give it a shot, maybe. Um, and so we, we go up to the front desk, and we pay, and you sign this waiver that says in 10,000 ways that if you die, it's not their fault. And then uh, you watch this video with an ambulance that streams across the screen just to make sure that you understand that this is dangerous. And, um, and then you go up in this plane. And as we're going up in this plane, we're going up to 12,500 feet. And, or 13,500 feet, and uh, the wind's coming through, it's cold, and then my friend just pops out of the plane, and I'm uncomfortable with that. And uh, <laughs> I've got this guy named Pedro who is taking me skydiving, and he's going to be my tandem jumper. And uh, he says, don't worry, you know, I'll be with you the whole time. Of course, that's a good thing because he's the one with the parachute. And uh, <laughs> so... Uh, I just go for it, and we get on the side of this plane, and we flip out, and you do these flips. And long story short, we're going 125 miles an hour, uh, 13,500 feet above the earth, and my cheeks are flapping. I'm screaming. I'm having the time of my life. And I get down to the bottom, and I'm paralyzed with smiles for the rest of the day. Uh, I bring that up for a certain reason, um, and it's not because I want to promote skydiving. Um, uh, though skydiving is pretty cool. Um, but what I am trying to promote is the reason why I got out of that plane. And what do you think it was that got me to jump out of that plane? No thoughts? The challenge. Absolutely. I mean, the challenge, the being excited by the rush of it. Otherwise, it wouldn't be exciting, right? Anything else? Trust. Definitely. Having, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so if I'm going down, somebody else is going down, too. Uh, yeah. No, totally. I mean, you, you've got somebody else who's going along for the ride with you. And uh, challenge was exciting. Uh, trust. I had friends, my friend, Tara, and then all these others who were pushing me along, who were saying, I'm there for you. You're going to enjoy it. They're encouraging me to take this risk. Risk-taking is a very critical part of youth empowerment. And it's, a, it's an important part of what we need to think about in terms of philanthropy and nonprofits and volunteerism. If we're going to empower others, we're taking a risk ourselves because we're entrusting somebody else to handle a responsibility that was formerly ours. And then we're asking them to take a risk, to take on these responsibilities. That's a, it's a big thing, and it requires us. And I bring that up because it's people like you in this room who have taken me skydiving. In times in my life when I felt like I was down, and so many other young people who I've worked with who have been through really tough situations. They need people like you, young people, older people, to be able to take them skydiving, to do these things for them, to help them take positive risks, unlike anything they've ever thought that they could achieve. That's our role. That's our part in this movement. So I want to talk about um, youth and philanthropy. Um, I'll come actually to this in a second. Um, so when we're talking about youth and philanthropy, this is a very important role. Youth can, or philanthropy can play uh, a very important part in, in this movement. Namely, um, there are other opportunities now, or there are other examples now in which philanthropy is doing that. 
For example, uh, Federal Youth Services Bureau under a guy named Harry Wilson, who is here with us this morning, asked him to come because uh, as in his role working as a presidential appointee, he finally got an administration to look at youth empowerment in the government's philanthropy at a federal level. And what he did was with the Federal Youth Services Bureau, which largely funds Runway and Homeless Youth Initiative, he got Runway and Homeless Youth on the grant-making board at a federal level in the government. That was in a very important step. It's not shared, unfortunately, by everything the administration does, but it was something that he achieved in this area, and that was a very important step forward. The Kellogg Foundation has invested 40, $46 million in Michigan and doing partner funds for community-based funds for young people. And then they've brought in communities uh, to match those funds with another $100 million so that they've been in, able to endow that for the long term. The Eckerd Family Foundation, a group I worked for, set up a scholarship board for young people uh, so that youth could receive scholarships through this. And sometimes it was a traditional scholarship uh, other for uh, university or college. Other times it was a kid who was in juvenile justice and just realized they weren't going to be able to get a job because they had a tattoo on their arm and needed to get a tattoo removal. So it's very flexible. And the one stipulation that they have by the foundation is that young people are involved in making those decisions. There are a lot of examples in which this has been done. There are a lot of examples in which this hasn't been done, and that philanthropy can grow in making and pushing this movement forward, namely involving young people in larger grant sizes. The average grant size for young people to be involved with in decision making is $2,500. That's a great experience for those of you who know Youth as Resources and Youth Venture and other groups that provide small community-based uh, grants for young people to make a difference in their communities. However, we can look at how we can value young people at larger adult level boards uh, where these funds are being put out. Um, at even larger levels, even more systematic levels, uh, systemic levels. But we again have to remember those components of the process to make that work. So I want to talk about youth empowerment context. It's important to note that what I'm telling you today is nothing new. Youth empowerment has been around for a long time. It's been called a few different things. I'll give you a few examples uh, among the many. How many of you have, uh, can name the, the, the big name for the midnight ride? we call the midnight ride in the U.S. Who do we associate with that? Thoughts? What was it? Paul Revere. Yeah, definitely. Paul Revere was the guy who went out on this midnight ride, rode the horse through town. I mean, really central part of, you know, American history in this story. And so we, you know, a lot of times we know Paul Revere. What we don't know uh, is often is who his original informer was. Anybody know? Okay, I didn't either. Um, his original informer was a 13-year-old boy named Sam Ballard, who had overheard the British talking about a conspiracy to, to kidnap um, Sam Adams and John Hancock. It was because they listened to this 13-year-old boy that our, convers uh, that our country took an, a critical turn. Another is the Children's March. I spent uh, uh, some time working with Runway and Homeless Youth at a youth empowerment conference in Birmingham. We had uh, people come in and talk to us about their experience in the Children's March. And those of you who don't know, is when Dr. Bart Martin Luther King came to a church uh, in Birmingham and he asked people to, to march in the streets for him. When he did that, there wasn't a single adult that stood up. It wasn't because they, you know, they were lazy or anything like that. Obviously, they shared the vision, but they had so many attachments. It was a huge risk for them because of everything that they had to do for their families and so forth. But one child stood up. And after that, another child. And then after that, another child. Another and another. Until every child in the church was standing up. Dr. Martin Luther King had his movement. From then on, they did this, uh, they did this planning for uh, transmission that would come through the radio for the secret day that young people, would, youth and children, would come from all over the area and march in the streets of Birmingham for uh, equality and freedom. And in that time, uh, when that day came, young people, children, were pouring literally out of the windows of schools. And teachers would now say that they wish they could have gone with. And these children came out by the hundreds and then the thousands. In the first day, about 500 children were, uh, were prisoned, and then 1,000 children the second day, and then close to 1,500. It was getting so big that they couldn't put the children in the jail cells anymore. So they, they had to create in the Central Park this huge fence to be able to put all of these children. In. And children had dogs sent after them. They had hoses shot at them, everything you can imagine. But these children kept going. One person came up to a small child, probably about five years old, who was standing behind this fence who was locked into it. And he asked, why are you here? And the child said, Theum, Theum. And the guy asked, who's Theum? Who is this Theum? 
What he's trying to say was freedom is there for freedom. This was uh, a movement that was very important for our national history. Uh, and then I bring up two others. Uh, one is um, John Stuart Mill, a critical British philosopher, Hailstrom uh, from the UK, and, uh, and then, as many of us know, he played a very important role in the political thought of the United States. And his line, um, in 1831, and again, he was only, now he was only 25 years old at this time, and he wrote a very important book called The Spirit of the Age. And in this book, he writes, um, the greater flexibility of the young, the greater accessibility to new ideas and new feelings, all which would otherwise be termed unsteadiness, renders them the sole hope for society. And then finally, I want to give one other, and that's the, the one on the left here. This man's name is Janusz Korczak. When I went to Israel for the first time, I went to the Holocaust Memorial. And outside of the Holocaust Memorial, or inside, was a children's uh, memorial dedicated to the 1.5 million children that were killed in the Holocaust. And outside of it was this bronze statue of a man named Janusz Korczak. And I asked about him, why is this statue out there? I hadn't heard of him. And they told me the short story on him, and then I was really inspired, so I went and tried to do more research and to read up on him. And as it turns out, uh, Janusz Korczak was a critical figure for youth development in the 1920s, before youth empowerment and positive youth development was even a phrase. He had started these, he had these orphanages, and this is in a time in Poland when orphans are bobbing for rotten potatoes off dirty floors while wealthy headmasters are eating nice dinners. And Korczak said, this isn't fair. This doesn't give dignity to our children, to our young people. So they set up these orphanages for Catholic and Jewish children, or any children who needed it. And the children would come in, and he, uh, he was kind of a funny guy. You know, he let children paint and, or uh, draw and crayon on his bald head, and he had a lot of affection for children. But uh, he also had a children's court, which if young people had a problem with the adults, that they could come back, they could bring the adults into these child courts that were run by child judges. He had a newspaper that was a national newspaper written by child orphans. And these orphans would uh, write these, uh, this series in the national newspaper, and the proceeds uh, of what they wrote would go back into supporting or buying shoes and clothes and feed the orphans throughout Poland. And so this was a movement of his that was a very powerful one. What we know about Korczak more frequently is not so much his, uh, his incredible advances in positive youth development for his time and even for now, but we know his last story. And that is when Janusz Korczak is in the Warsaw Ghetto. He's trapped in, in this ghetto. He's forced to go in there with all, of the, with all the other Jews in this area. And um, he's now told you can only have an orphanage, of course, for Jewish children. And, uh, but he is allowed to still keep an orphanage. While they're in the Warsaw Ghetto, uh, they've got all these children in there, and people are dying and starving and going crazy all around the orphanage. And in this one orphanage, they have children who are allowed to continue to, to come in. And the children don't have anything to eat, but he tells them the singing will be our food, and it will be the food for the others who can come and to be with us. And the last memory of Korchak, Korchak keeps getting these invitations, because he was very famous as a child psychologist. He keeps getting these invitations to leave. And even to the last day, when he, is, uh, he knows that the children are about to be brought out of the orphanage and they're going to be taken to the death camp. And he is again given an opportunity by the Gestapo, a pass to leave, and he refuses. He says he's not going to. And the last memory of Janusz Korczak is of him holding one child in his arm, another in his hand, with 120 children marching behind him. And everybody is screaming and terrified around them, except for this one army of children, all with their heads up. He walks himself and his children to their death. And the reason I bring that up is, uh, one, because of the importance that he played in history for youth development to recognize that what we're talking about, what I'm talking about, is goes back uh, in, in many years and to many other contexts, but also to say that he made a sacrifice. And while I hope that none of us will ever have to make a sacrifice, anything near like what Janusz Korczak had to make, we do have to make sacrifices in empowerment. The word empower suggests to give power. Um, and to give power means to give up power, to lose power. And so in that, every one of us has to make a sacrifice, and so do our institutions, to be able to lift up young people and give them value. These are a couple of references. If anybody is interested in particular on the subject of youth and philanthropy, these are two journal, journals that have been well done, and you could pull them both off of line. Um, and then I'm going to move into another subject, which is this idea of outcomes versus impacts. Uh, or uh, Yes, I'm sorry, um, outputs versus impacts. 
Has anybody in here ever worked at a store before, grocery store, convenience store? One, 